Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us today for this course experience and admissions event. My, the title for my talk is There's No App for That, Why Humanities in the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I think that the Fourth Industrial Revolution is a really crucial driving force in today's society and will be a driving force for solving global challenges. It's one of the reasons that we have just added as our most recent major computational uh, and data sciences uh, because of that importance. At the same time, I think that other disciplines, including the humanities where I'm from, remain crucial to solving global challenges as well. Uh, the, the tools of the fourth industrial revolution need these other kinds of knowledges to maximize uh, their effect and to make sure that we use them well. And so, in part, this is a talk about the kind of education that we offer at George Mason University, which comes from the American liberal arts tradition which, in which people study across a broad range of disciplines, no matter what they major in. And so I'll be talking about that. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself, because uh, some of these questions I've been thinking about for a very long time. Uh, I'm currently campus dean at George Mason University, but I started uh, at George Mason in 1993 as a professor in our English department. And my background is in English literature, and uh, my specialty is in Renaissance English literature. Uh, the Renaissance um, uh, in England was between about 1485 and 1660, and it produced some of the great uh, writers of the English language, including, I think, uh, uh, um, Dean uh, Chung mentioned uh, William Shakespeare. Interestingly, though, during this time, writing literature was not seen as a very useful thing to do. And particularly, writing poetry was seen by many people as quite a waste of time. Um, and one of the authors I write about, so the title of my book is Defending Literature in Early Modern England. How in this period did people defend writing literature? One of the people I write about, his name is Philip, was Philip Sidney. He was a knight. He was also a soldier. Um, uh, he was a member of uh, Queen Elizabeth's court, the reigning queen at the time. And he wrote a, 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 an essay called The Defense of Poetry. And in it, he quotes some of the uh, statements that are made against poetry. Uh, and I'll read a couple. One is that there are better kinds of knowledge to study. He says, there being many other more fruitful knowledges, more productive knowledges, a man might better spend his time in than in, than in this, than in poetry. So if you're going to study something, don't study poetry. Study something else. And worse, poetry is just a waste of time. It's just a game. Uh, and this is another criticism he, he mentions. Before poets did soften us, we were full of courage given to martial exercises. We were good soldiers, the pillars of man-like liberty, and not lulled to sleep in shady idleness with poets' pastimes. So he goes on and he uh, argues why poetry is really important as, a, as, as, a, as an enterprise, as something to do. Um, and we can hear echoes of this in this question now about what should I study? Why might I study literature? when we see so much social impact uh, in areas like technology, in the areas that are driving the fourth industrial revolution, why, why study the humanities? So these are questions, one, that I've been thinking about for a long time, and two, that go back hundreds and hundreds of years in the Western tradition, and I'll talk about that. First, though, I just want to back up a little bit and talk about these different domains of knowledge to just get some terms uh, set for us. Uh, so, one category of domains of knowledge is the humanities, and that's the, that's the area that I come from. And, and the humanities include history, literature, 
languages, philosophy, religious studies, works of human culture. Then there are the social sciences, and you'll be hearing from a couple of my colleagues in the social sciences uh, coming up, economics, anthropology, global affairs, psychology, sociology are some of those fields. There are the sciences, such as biology, chemistry, math, and physics. And in the last 20 years or so, there's been a new category um, that overlaps with the sciences that is referred to as STEM, uh, an, uh, an acronym for uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so there are these different kinds of knowledge, and going back thousands of years, there have been debates about, well, what, what's the most productive kind of knowledge? What's the master knowledge? Um, and in the 19th century, it was often argued that the knowledge that founds all others is philosophy. Philosophy tells you uh, what more you need to study. Uh, in the 20th century, it's been very much uh, the rise of technology and engineering. And at least in the 21st century so far, we can say it's a particular flavor of, of, te of, of technology and engineering. Uh, those technologies that particularly drive the fourth industrial revolution, big data, artificial intelligence, the internet of things so that you can take uh, your machine learning and, and uh, have that learning actually then uh, through the Internet of Things, create autonomous production. Uh, that is, have machines creating new machines and running machines. So in this talk, I want to argue three things. I want to argue for the importance of non-STEM knowledge along with STEM knowledge. Not, not against it, but along with it. And in fact, I want to argue that with the adv advent of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, driven by STEM, non-STEM knowledge will in some ways become even more important. And finally, I want to use the tools of the humanities, knowledge of history and philosophy, the analysis of imaginative works, as well as uh, some of those of the social sciences and business to make points one and two. So I'm making an argument from some of the tools that I have within the humanities. And I start with at least in the US, a really iconic, a really famous advertisement and slogan. Uh, and this was, I, this iPhone looks pretty primitive now. I think it must have been like iPhone 1 or 2. Um, uh, but it was an ad for one of the early iPhones that said, there's an app for that. Uh, and the idea in this slogan that was very powerful uh, is that whatever problem you have, there's an application that can solve it. And more broadly then, if we have global challenges, we will solve them through science and engineering, that the solutions to global challenges are technical in nature. And that's reflected in how we often think about how we solve global challenges now. The interesting thing, though, is that the founder of Apple, or the co-founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, did not believe that technology alone was sufficient. He very famously said, this is a quote from Steve Jobs, it is in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields the result that makes our hearts sing. And it's interesting here that he even moves towards the language of poetry or music of the humanities when he says, the results finally have to, have to sing. They have to be beautiful. Not just technologically productive, but beautiful. And I'd like to just think about what are some problems for which there are no apps. I know we're, it's a little hard over Zoom, but if anybody would uh, like to just suggest what might be something that you couldn't solve with a piece of technology with an app, please uh, raise your hand or unmute your mic. I'll, I'll give it a few seconds. You got any takers? All right, well, I'll, I'll start going through my list. And uh, if anybody wants to contribute further, please go ahead. 
So they can't really organize our feelings. If we have mixed feelings about something, they're not really going to be able to say, how, how should I feel about what just happened? They can't decide questions of values or ethics. Wh what should I do in this solution? If, 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 I, if I need uh, medication so badly, is it okay to rob a pharmacy? A famous philosophical question. Though they can provide lots of information, they can't really evaluate complex competing claims. They cannot on their own generate complex writing or ideas. For example, uh, they can't write your English or history paper. And they cannot create compelling imaginative work. The very iPhone ad that attempts to represent in an appealing way, the powerful technology is interestingly not fundamentally a technological product, but an imaginative one. And this list of things that we want to be able to do, but that technology can't, are some of the things that the humanities and other disciplines help us to do. So I want to turn now to this question about the relationship of different kinds of knowledge, and especially to the to technological knowledge. Um, this question about how the different kinds of knowledge relate goes, as I was saying, back hundreds and hundreds of years, over, over thousands of years, actually, in the Western uh, intellectual tradition. Uh, and it was a subject of debate in classical Greek thought uh, 3,000 years ago. Uh, and our word technology comes from a Greek word, techne, which means craft or skill. A techne is a craft or a skill. Uh, and philosophers such as Plato, Aristotle, asked, what is, a, what is the role of craft or skill in the kinds of human knowledge and in human life? And Aristotle, for example, defined five con kinds of knowledge. So it was craft, theory, sort of overarching knowledge, practical knowledge, things we do intuitively, wisdom, and intellect. In this Western philosophical tradition, uh, there's, a, there's a recognition of the place of technology, or, or rather of techne, uh, and also its limits in relationship to other kinds of knowledge. And I'm going to go back to my uh, uh, old study, Philip Sidney. Um, who, in defending poetry, is writing within this Western intellectual tradition when he thinks about the role, especially of what is techne, that is a craft. And he's now not talking about, interestingly, master knowledge, but mistress knowledge. He changes it to a woman, the mistress knowledge. And he says, so what is the most important kind of knowledge? The mistress knowledge stands in the knowledge of a man's self. That's the most important thing you have to know. Who are you as a person? And in the ethic and political consideration with the end of well-doing and not of well-knowing only. So not only do you have to know who you are, but that has to lead you to do good then. Even as the saddler, and the saddler, someone who makes a horse's saddle is, uh, is, is uh, uh, pursuing a craft, a techne. Even as the saddler's next end is to make a good saddle, but his farther end is to serve a nobler faculty, a nobler skill, which is horsemanship. So the horseman to soldiery. So you learn to be a horseman so you can be a soldier. And the soldier not only to have the skill, but to perform the practice of a soldier. So that the ending end of all earthly learning is virtuous action. So it's great to be able to know how to make a saddle, but there's a limited role for that. You make the saddle so you can have someone who knows how to ride a horse, and it's great to know how to ride a horse, but you want to know how to ride a horse so you can be a soldier. And you don't just want to be a soldier for any reason. You want to be a soldier because that's a virtuous action in the defense of your country, which is what Sidney really wanted to do. Um, so the master knowledge is this, well, not only knowing yourself and therefore knowing what to do, but doing it. In the 20th century in particular, as techne becomes technology, an argument is, and, and so really even more powerful than something like making a saddle, uh, 
there's an argument that comes to be made, and one example is uh, from a German philosopher, Martin Heidegger, that technology ends up um, uh, becoming too all-encompassing. Uh, technology promises to master the world for us in the way making a saddle would never master the world for us. Technology promises to master the world for us. But because we're part of that world, it ends up mastering us too. We find ourselves becoming part of the machines we have created. And this is a very abstract idea. And so I want to turn to a couple of video images that I think will help us imagine this uh, more uh, uh, effectively. Uh, and the first is from a uh, movie, uh, silent movie by the famous comic Charlie Chaplin called Modern Times. It's from 1936. And Chaplin is um, uh, reacting to a movement that goes back even earlier to the 1880s called Taylorism, which was about trying to make human production uh, in factories and, and offices as efficient as possible. So people would come with clipboards and look, what is the shortest way from point A to point B? And how can you have people moving so they don't get in, in, in the way of one another? And they would try to make people as efficient as the machines they were using. And you can see how uh, Chaplin, reflecting this, sees people becoming like machines and being consumed quite literally by machines. So we'll start this uh, video, which I also hope you find uh, entertaining. Um, so you can see in the beginning of the video, uh, uh, Chaplin is moved. The, the, the music is machine-like, and Chaplin is kind of moving like a machine. Turn, 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 just like the gears. And he becomes so consumed by the machine that eventually he ends up in the gears. It's like he's eaten by the machine or consumed by the machine. Uh, and again, I think this is a reflection on this idea that machines are mastering us rather than uh, vice versa. One of the things that interests me, though, is once he's in the gears, the music changes to flutes. And oddly, it becomes very graceful as he gets run through the gears. And then when he comes out, he's like a dancer. And he's also even funnier, because he's using his tool to turn people's noses and, and whatnot. And I really see this as kind of the revenge of the imagination, uh, the revenge of comic film. Uh, obviously, you can't really be run through gears. And so it's a work of imagination. And as as he can imagine this funny thing about being run through years, it's like he's freed from the machine. He can imagine something else. And then he can do funny things, which are a way of imagining uh, something else. Uh, and I see that as part of the role of the humanities, to imagine other things and to, to um, uh, use other human capacities other than uh, uh, machine-like production. My next video is a less optimistic, um, I think, version of, well, um, it's, it's a different tone, and I'll talk about it in a second. Um, this is from uh, a commercial for the Android operating system. I talked about the iPhone. I want to make sure that I uh, uh, give equal time to Android. Uh, and uh, you'll see a, another image of a human becoming a machine. So this is supposed to be uh, uh, an advertisement for the Andro Android phone, uh, a reason that we should want to use the operating system and uh, the, the phone that it, uh, the phone that it uh, uh, drives, because it makes us so efficient. It gives us the efficiency of a machine so that we become Androids ourselves so that we become like machines. We are, again, consumed by the machines we use. But I don't know about you, but I kind of like my hands. 
uh, I'm not sure that I want to uh, have machine hands. Uh, I'm not sure that I want the only value in my life to be uh, machine-like efficiency. And the other thing is I'm not sure much is getting done at this conference table. One of the things you can notice is that everyone's just staring at their phones, click, click, clicking. I don't, I don't hear anyone who's talking about problems or coming up with new ideas, which would be a different set of skills. Um, and in fact, uh, turning in my talk now, I think partly it's the skills that you get from the kind of education that we offer in the US that we offer here uh, at George Mason. Uh, and those are the skills uh, and knowledge of a liberal arts education. And when we talk about the liberal arts, we mean the uh, joint study of the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. And there's an American liberal arts tradition that goes back uh, uh, hundreds of years. And uh, in the little picture that I have here, uh, uh, I have a picture of the, of the typical uh, small American liberal arts college. And you can see the difference from the scene at the conference table. Here, uh, we have a bunch of people in the uh, bottom corner of the picture talking to one another. And the, the leafy uh, uh, walk says, this is a more relaxed place. This is a place where you can take some time and talk to one another. Um, and that's sort of what the liberal arts is about. It's about taking a little more time to explore more areas, to get new ideas. Two key ideas about the liberal arts is um, or is that a well-rounded student should study all areas of knowledge, want to gain multiple perspectives, that there's not just one kind of knowledge that will answer questions. We need multiple perspectives. And it's not only about answering problems effectively, it's also about what it means to be human, to realize our full human capacities as a thinking person. We, have, we can think in lots of different ways. And we, we should have the freedom to learn without constraint. We should be able to explore new things, new ideas, not just learn one thing. So it's about human freedom, fundamentally, and human, our humanity, but it's also, again, about effectiveness to solve problems. The well-rounded student, we believe, can more effectively act in the world with all kinds of knowledge at his or her disposal. And because we also know that we can't know everything, um, we kind of make, a, I think, a really good complementary uh, set of goals. One is a broad uh, study of lots of different kinds of knowledge, and then the other is an in-depth study of one kind of knowledge, and that's your major. And while this American liberal arts tradition is old, it's also very new. That is, it's also more and more seen as the kind of learning that we will need in the fourth industrial revolution, in the machine age. And I quote here from a study from 2011 from a think tank uh, called the Institute for the Future about what's going to happen to work as more and more machines do some of the um, automatable tasks of the fourth industrial re revolution. Um, so they write, as machines replace humans in some tasks, and augment them in others, their largest impact may be less obvious. Their very presence among us will force us to confront important questions. What are humans uniquely good at? What is our comparative advantage? And what is our place alongside these machines? We will have to rethink the content of our work and our work processes in response. And their answers are many of the skills that one gets through the humanities and through a broader liberal arts education. So making sense of things, seeing the deeper meaning behind things, the deeper significance of something. Social intelligence, understanding how people react to one another, what people are thinking, what, what are their concerns. Novel and adaptive thinking, being creative. Cross-cultural competency, understanding other cultures, and something that we particularly do here at Mason Korea. Computational thinking, it's not, not that math and uh, uh, data aren't important, they are, but it's one of the skills you want. Along with new media literacy, and I won't go through them all, but I'll just also note transdisciplinarity, 
As workplaces get both more complex and more integrated at the same time, we need to know how to talk across our areas of expertise. And, and that goes uh, to the kind of student that people in human resources, uh, people who are doing the hiring, more and more say they want, which is sometimes called the T-shaped student. Uh, and it's called the T-shaped student because um, it's imagined to be a student who has both broad learning across the top of the T and then some in-depth subject within a major. Uh, and companies like these T-shaped students because they can carry out a particular set of interests or tasks through their in-depth knowledge, but they also have the broad learning that lets them talk to other teams, lets them talk to other people, and lets them get new perspectives even on what they're working on. Uh, and again, um, the liberal arts tradition is old. This idea of the T-shaped student is new, but it's what the liberal arts produce. And it's, it's one of the reasons that I think that a liberal arts education is really uh, a fantastic way to enter the workforce. There's another reason, I think, in terms of one's own career, where this liberal arts tradition is uh, uh, so important, and that's um, because we change jobs more and more in the 21st century. So you may be called on to do more and more things, different things as you change jobs. So what you need to have is not just knowing about one thing, but knowing about lots of things, and even more importantly, cultivating the ability to learn how to learn which is what a liberal arts education does. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here from a famous professor of management from the University of Pennsylvania's Warden School, uh, who says, um, the time spent in college learning uh, practical knowledge might lead to a first job, such as the latest uh, healthcare regulations. So, you, uh, um, so by learning the latest healthcare regulations, you might get a first job that way, but it comes at the expense of learning other things that have a much longer shelf life. How do we get the knowledge or the ability to reinvent ourselves or even change fields if all we've ever been taught is the practical skills in one field? So if all we've learned is something very narrow, we're not gonna be able to reinvent ourselves or to move up in our job, whereas you move up, you need to be able to do other things. And I have found this personally to be very, very true. I've come a long way uh, from uh, reading Philip Sidney, from writing about English literature. I'm now uh, very much a manager. Uh, uh, and I go back to the things I learned in the humanities and my liberal arts education every day. Uh, and I feel like that education has really allowed me to grow in an important way. And this is something that other countries uh, have recognized, too. I think it's one of the reasons that we are in Korea right now. Uh, so this is from an article from Forbes magazine, uh, The Rise of Liberal Arts Colleges in Asia. In recent years, a revival of the liberal arts model may be coming from a most unlikely place, Asia. In, in recent years, educators and administrators in countries like China, Japan, South Korea and Singapore are focusing on schools which focus on critical thinking and creativity. Uh, you get those kinds of learning from what we do in the liberal arts, in the humanities, where not only are you learning many different perspectives because you're learning uh, from different kinds of areas of knowledge, but you're also being asked not only to learn uh, information, but to analyze it, to test it, to critique it in dialogue with your instructors and in dialogue with other students. And that is so powerful to me. And it is, it is, it is, it is kind of the ob opposite of the Charlie Chaplin, just turn, 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 turn. That's what we're trying to do here. And if we think about the liberal arts and global challenges, I just want to just reflect a little bit on some of the global challenges that we have for which there's no app. Um, so uh, peace building and national or cultural con 
conflict. I think it's, it's pretty clear here we can't just solve these through a technical solution. We have to think about history. We have to think about different interests. We have to think about how we communicate with one another. These are all um, uh, uh, subjects uh, uh, for which the humanities and social sciences are, are very uh, important. Likewise, rising social inequality. Um, we have to think about what's just. What do one group of people owe to another people? As well as what the best way uh, to address that through, say, economic means, through different tax uh, systems or through um, uh, minimum wages. But you might say, like, OK, yeah, of course those. I can see why I need the social sciences and humanities. But I want to argue that even uh, problems that do look like they are problems that are mainly technological problems or scientific problems really are only partly that. And I think a good example is climate change. The science around climate change is pretty much settled. Uh, we know what's causing it. We have pretty good predictive models for it. Uh, to solve climate change, we really are back to the humanities and social sciences. Uh, to use those tools effectively because we have to say like how do we communicate uh, to people the dangers of climate change when it's very hard to see from day to day that's a question of the imagination how do we help people imagine climate change it's also a question of economics and of justice who should pay for the kinds of steps we're going to need to take to solve climate change uh, should it be evenly distributed across nations? Or should the nations who have contributed the most to climate change pay the most? Should the wealthiest nations pay the most? These are all active questions, and they're, they're not technological questions. Another one is cybersecurity. Uh, there is a lot of, of, of work within uh, the STEM fields on how you make uh, computer systems that are, are, are secure, but it turns out that um, the weakest link in a computer system is the person who's using the computer. Uh, and that's why our psychology department at, at uh, George Mason has gotten lots of grant money working on, on, on cybersecurity because there's something called human engineering. How do you get that person to click on that link and give you their password? And no matter how strong you make your technology, if you can, if you can write to someone and say, hey, it's an emergency. You're going to lose all your access unless you give me your password, unless you can figure out how to tell people, don't do that. Um, you're not going to have secure cyber systems. So again, it's a human problem as well as a technological problem. Uh, disinformation has been a, 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 a large problem, uh, uh, certainly with the advent of social media. We can use algorithms to flag disinformation, but to really give people the critical skills to, to judge between what might be true and what might be false, they need, again, some of the uh, uh, practice that you get through a liberal arts education where you learn about evaluating sources. You learn about uh, studying where the source might come from. And finally, I'll just take one that's very uh, close to home uh, now, pandemics. Uh, again, uh, it is a, a, a miracle. It's a, a, a fantastic thing that through bioinformatics and biological sciences, we now have a vaccine, but we also have people who are suspicious of taking vaccines. How do we persuade them? And before we had the vaccine, and right now, we have to persuade everyone to be careful, to wear our masks, to social distance. That's a human problem, right? So all of these problems, even where they have important technological facets, also have really important human facets. And I think as we go forward, to to make sure that we are the masters and the best users of these technological tools of the fourth industrial revolution, we need to also keep our eye on the human questions that are always really what's driving how we use technology. And I'll end with uh, the George Mason mission statement. And I'll just, don't worry, I won't go through all four points of it. Uh, but I will just uh, point to the overall mission, which I think is important. And I'll, I'll read the uh, italic uh, part. We are an innovative and inclusive academic community to creating, uh, committed to creating a more just, 
free and prosperous world. And I think that's the important thing. It's not the creation of a certain technology or a certain kind of knowledge. It's the goal. Like the saddle maker is making a saddle to enable the knight. We are learning all kinds of knowledge, scientific and non-scientific knowledge, to create a more just, free, and prosperous world. I have been proud uh, to, I hope, be part of that project through my study of the humanities uh, and through this broader liberal arts tradition. And uh, I hope some of you will join us. So thank you very much.